Rabbi Magoyim O'Eler, me many. This is when we come to Canaan. He says, when you will say in your heart, it's some, something you don't even verbalize, something you think. These nations are Rabbim. They're more than we are, greater than we are. Uchal, uchal, lodishim, how could we conquer them? Osirumihem. You should not fear them. Remember all that Hashem had done to Paro and all of Egypt. As he goes to explain, Hamasus Agdolos, Asheroinecho, the great miracles which you saw with your own eyes, the Osus Vamosim, the signs and the wonders. The powerful hand, and the outstretched arm, meaning the various levels of intervention on God's part to bring about the redemption of Egypt, and therefore it's referred to as the powerful hand and the outstretched arm, which God had taken you out. God will do the same to all these nations that you were fearful of them. Meaning, the reason why you should not be fearful is because you should remember what God had done to Paro and the Egyptians and Egypt. The miracles you witnessed with your own eyes. It's not something which is hearsay. It's something that you you witnessed and experienced for, firsthand. So, firstly, many of the people who we're speaking to now were not born in Egypt, because we had said that the generation between twenty and sixty at the time in Raglim, which was the second year of the desert, they're no longer alive. So, this is speaking. We're speaking of thirty-eight years later. Moshe is speaking to them. So when he says, those who saw with their own eyes, he's not speaking to all of them. But if you have, I'll give you an example. We speak with the Holocaust. You have those who denied the Holocaust. It ever happened. Or if it happened, it was a much smaller scale. It wasn't the genocide that so-called the Jews say. But if there are enough Holocaust survivors, the deniers cannot deny it. Because there are enough witnesses who, who experienced it firsthand, and therefore they can't deny it. It's only today where there are no survivors because they all passed on, so therefore they have the audacity and they want to convince the world that it never happened. Since there are a substantial amount of people who were in Egypt who saw it firsthand, therefore they are the witnesses. So even the ones who didn't, but since they're exposed and they have relationships with the ones who did see it firsthand it's as if they saw it firsthand therefore it's something which it's not history but rather it's reality and therefore he says to them the great miracles that you saw with your own eyes and the signs and the judgment and the powerful hand the outstretched arm that Hashem had taken you out he will do the same to the nations that you're fearful of them just a simple understanding I always say that a person graduates graduates uh, business school and he comes back and he becomes part of his father's business. And his father built this very successful business. And his father says, you see this person here, I have a relation with him for 50 years. We've been through thick and thin together. He's never failed me. You could trust him with your life. And the son believes his father. Doesn't question his father's word. But yet, the level of trust which the father has in this person and the son, it's not the, the same. Until the son experiences 
that level of integrity and trust which the father shared with him, only then is he secure with that level of trust. Because it's not he doesn't believe his father. It's only it's purely something which is considered abstract. So when you witness something firsthand, the Jews who stood at Sinai and were touched by the Shekhinah, the divine presence, they openly were communicated to. And they saw God speaking to Moshe. It's a different reality when we speak about the word of Hashem, the Sinai. There's a mitzvah that say that a person, a positive commandment, we should not forget what happened at Sinai. It's something we should share with our children. It's one of the six zechiros, one of the six positive commandments. What we say it to the, today is what we call misora. It's purely tradition passed down for generation after generation. It's not the same. It's the unbroken chain, but it's not the same. But when Moshe is speaking to the Klausel now on the Avery Arnain, on the Transjordan side, and he says, as I said, because there are enough representatives of the ones who witnessed it firsthand, even those who did not, because they have that level of relationship with those, it's as if they themselves actually witnessed it themselves. And that's what he's saying to them. Over here, there's a Sepharno, very important Sepharno. He says, if you will say in your heart, these nations are numerous and greater than we are, how can I conquer them? So the Sepharno says over here, it's very important. He says, When you're going to ask the question, how could we conquer them? They're greater than we are. You should not say that because you're truly fearful of them. That, it should not be said in that context. Meaning, humanly, naturally, it's impossible. You should say, you should not fear them because what is impossible is possible. Normally, under normal circumstances, something you would fear. Meaning, you have to appreciate what's happening because of your specific and personal predicament, which is not like anything else. It's like amazement when you say, how could I conquer these nations that are greater with us? It's not because you're truly a question, how could it happen? No, it's with amazement. And if you say it with amazement, then you're truly touched by God's bringing about, but there's never a question that it's not going to happen. You should remember what Hashem had done to Paro and all those who afflicted us. And God gave them into your hand. And you actually, you destroyed them. Therefore, with amazement, you should say, Hashem will do it again. But it's not a question where you doubt, will he or won't he? He will. And therefore, you will enter it and you approach it with amazement. And you go with confidence that it's going to happen. It's interesting, in the Pasuk Yudches, it says, remember all that Hashem had done to, to Paro and Mitzrayim. What are we seeing about Paro? Again, we find in Parshish Yisro, when Yisro had come and Moshe had shared with Yisro all that happened and all the Jews, what the Jews experienced, the Torah says, over there Moshe says, he shared with Yisro all that Hashem had done to Paro and to Egypt. Also, Paro was singled out individually and to Egypt. Here also, when Moshe says, remember all that Hashem had done, not to the Egyptians only, but what he had done to Paro and to Egypt. It's two, we're talking about two entities. Paro in his own right had a certain representation of evil. The Egyptians had their own. One was a nation, one was an individual. But Paro in his own right had a representation of evil. I'll give you an example. 
We have mentioned many times that the Ramchal cites a Zohar that we speak about there are four exiles. We have the Babylonian exile, we have the Persian exile, we have the Greeks, and we have the Edomites. Right? We have four exiles. So he cites the Zohar, Reb Shemichoy asks, what if there should be five exiles? Why isn't Egypt counted as one of the exiles? You have the Egyptians, you have the Babylonians, you have the Persians, you have the Greeks, and you have the Edomites. Why aren't they counted? So Reb Shemichoy explains, this is Reb Shemichoy's answer in the Zohar. Factually speaking, we were supposed to be in Egypt 400 years. We left after 210 years. If we would have been there 400 years, what would have happened? We would have totally assimilated. We would have gone beyond the 49th level of impurity. We would have gone to spiritual oblivion. Never to return. We would have never actually had the capacity to go to Sinai, to become God's people. Therefore, God took us out of, after 10, 210 years, but there was a balance of, 108, of 190 years, which we didn't experience. The effect of Egypt, the evil that Egypt represented, which they had inculcated into us, which had to be purged, was not fully purged in Egypt. The four exiles which follow Egypt, that's to complete what was supposed to happen in Egypt, which never happened. So the four exiles we experienced after Egypt is a carryover of what happened in Egypt. This is Rabbi Shemichoy's answer. So therefore, there are four. Basically, there was Egypt. Egypt brought about this level of damage to us, and we never recovered. It takes four exiles to recover from the negative impact of the Egyptians. So basically, the four exiles are really a carryover of the one exile. Therefore, they counted as four, not as five. That's from Shemichoy. It, it, it's interesting, there's an obvious question. Before Ishtabach, when we're, we finish Psuki de Zimra, we say Oz Yoshir, which Moshe had set at the splitting of the sea after the sea cl closed on the Egyptians. And we conclude Oz Yoshir, V'olu Moshim Bartzion Lishbaris Harizov. And the saviors will ascend to Mount Seir, which is Edom which is the exile which we're still experiencing now, it's the longest exile, Lishvot is Haraisov, to judge Mount Esov, Voisol Hashem Amlucha. And God then will be acknowledged that he is the only king, nothing exists outside of himself. We say it every day. The question is, what does the judgment of the Edomites what relevance does that have to do with Yitzhiz Mitzrayim? With the Egyptian redemption? Does Yoshir? What exactly, how are they connected? So with the Zohar, with Roshim Yechoi, it's directly linked. Well, when the Edomites are going to be judged and they're going to go into the oblivion and they're going to be destroyed and removed from existence, the effect of the Egyptian exile is completed. Because now what we're experiencing now, it's only due to the spiritual impurities which we absorbed in Egypt. And we're still carrying that debt. We haven't paid the debt yet. So that's the linkage between But Paro is the one. He is the king. He is the monarch of that entity which actually tried to destroy us to the point where we nearly didn't make it out. Therefore, when Moshe had shared with Yisro's father-in-law all the, that the Jews experienced in Egypt, it wasn't only what Hashem had done to Paro, Ula Mitzrayim. Paro in his own right had a representation of evil. The Egyptians were the cohorts. 
but it was two entities. Each one complemented the other in terms of bringing us down, spiritually speaking. So Moshe over here says, don't be fearful of them. Remember all that Hashem had done to Paro Ule Mitzrayim. Same thing. What Hashem had done to Paro and to Mitzrayim and to Egypt. We find that every prophet, when he prophesizes, he sees Hashem in different guises. For instance, at Kriyas Yamsuf, who was Hashem? How, how was he seen? He was seen as Ishmael Choma. He was a man of war. After the Chet Egel, where Hashem had taught Moshe Rabbeinu that if the Jews are ever in a situation where the most extreme level of din is in effect, they should say the 13 attributes of mercy. Yud Gimel Mirzarachmim. And how did Moshe see Hashem in that moment? Zokein Shinesati Petalis, like an elderly sage who was wrapped in a talus. And Hashem says, and he understood, and this is Chazal, the Medrash, it's the same entity, it's God, but it's the way God relates to this existence. The times that he's a man of war, that was destroyed to destroy the Egyptians at Kriyas Yamsuf. When we need that level of Rachmim, then he's what? He's there to suppress the attribute of justice. Like an elderly stage who's supplicating Hashem, doing whatever he can to suppress the attribute and to counter the prosecution against the Jewish people. So we're talking about, don't be fearful. Remember all that Hashem had done to Paro and the Egyptians. And as a result of that, you don't be fearful I mean, it's not, you are, I mean, understand what's happening and it should be experienced with amazement. It's unbelievable. Humanly, it's impossible. But just as Hashem had done it then with amazement, Hashem will do it again. I'll give you an example. A child, and Rabbi Bachir writes, when a child is born and the child is nursed by its mother, all that exists in that child's life is the mother. But even before the child's intelligence begins developing. Why? Because the child naturally is attracted to the, its mother's milk. Its whole existence is its mother's milk. As the child gets a little bit older, the child recognizes that it has two parents, a mother, mother and father. And as the child gets older, he realizes that his security is his father. His father could do no wrong. His father is, could deal with every issue and his father is there to protect him. And therefore the child is never afraid because he believes the father has that ability to deal with every issue. But as the child gets old, he realizes it's not so simple. And ultimately you have to come to a level of belief, believe in Hashem, that Hashem is there for you. But there's a stage in life where the child believes his father is the equivalent of Superman. There's nothing, there's nothing my father can't do. There's no one he can't stand up against. That's the level of belief and faith and trust we have to have in Hashem. And that's what Moshe is saying to them. After seeing what Hashem had done to, to Egypt, regardless of the impossibilities, God turned over worlds the 10 plagues, the splitting of the sea, the destruction of the Egyptians' armies, and power regardless of what he represented in evil. Identically, because Hashem has shown himself, and you understand that, you should not fear them, mean, therefore with amazement, you should understand what's, what's coming down the pike, that all these nations are going to be destroyed regardless of how great they are, and how numerous they are, it's not even an issue, because as Hashem had done in the past, he will repeat it again and bring about the end result.